We're reading from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell richly among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs through the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm very grateful to Ray Galeer, your senior pastor, for the invitation to be here. I represent Anglican Aid, which is the overseas aid agency of the Sydney Diocese. I'm going to say very little about it, except that if you'd like to know more about our work in 28 countries, 16 African countries, including Zimbabwe, and 12 other countries across the Middle East and the subcontinent and the Asia-Pacific, go to our website, anglicanaid.org.au. Henry Alonga, who you're going to meet in a moment, is a global ambassador for Anglican Aid, and that's why we're here together. An international cricketer, as you have heard, a political activist who risked his life to confront the evil dictatorship of Robert Mugabe. And more recently, he's come to be known, especially in Australia, as a very fine classical singer. To help us understand a little bit more about that last aspect of Henry's life, let's watch this video and then I'll introduce Henry. Christian family here at MBM Rudy Hill, would you welcome Mr. Henry Alonga? Henry, happy Father's Day. Thank you, David, and to you too. Thank you. Henry and Tara, who you saw on that very brief clip in the green dress, very excited when the chairs turned, they live in Adelaide and they have two beautiful daughters. But we'll come to that a little later. Henry, these are the, the wonderful people of Rooty Hill. MBM, Rooty Hill, but they come from all over different parts of Sydney. So just say hi to them. What a funny name, Rudy Hill. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Henry. Show what I mean. Shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> Can we focus, please? Can we focus, please? Born in Zambia. First couple of years of your life in Kenya schooled in Zimbabwe, a fugitive in South Africa, exiled in England, and now you live 
in Australia with your family. Potential citizenship of six nations. Whatever you do, don't go into federal politics. <laughs> Henry, tell us uh, how it all began, as much as you know. Well, um, I was very young when I was born. <laughs> and it went something like this. It was dark, and then it was light. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, I was born in Lusaka, Zambia in 76. Uh, Zimbabwean mother, Kenyan father. They met in hospital. My mom was a nurse, dad was a doctor. Fell in love. Victor was born, Victor's my older brother, born in uh, 74, so he's two years older than me. He's actually always been two years older than me. And uh, we then moved from Lusaka, Zambia to uh, East Africa. We moved to Kenya. We lived in Nairobi for a couple of years. And it was there that my uh, mother noticed at family gatherings, I think you call them Barbies here, that <laughs> there were more than a few children running around who bore more than a passing resemblance to my brother and I. So she made some inquiries, and uh, on making the inquiries, she discovered that my dad had actually been married to another lady called Prisca. They had 10 children together, actually 12, two died very young. Um, and he hadn't divorced her when he married my mom. Can you see the problem there? <laughs> Actually not allowed to do that. But anyway, um, on, on discovering this, my mom, of course, was mortified. She was a very religious, pious woman. And uh, cutting a long story short, instead of finding sympathy with my uh, dad and his clan, uh, my, my dad's brothers, all my uncles, kind of gathered around. And, and basically told her she was being a bit of a drama queen and overreacting a little. <laughs> Um, but she, she just, she was mortified, so she left. She went to Zimbabwe, where she was from, and settled there in Harare, the capital city. Yes, she left us behind. Uh, and then um, my, my dad uh, took both my brother and I to Zimbabwe and tried to reconcile. That didn't work. And so I ended up uh, going to boarding school from a young age. So most of your schooling was at two all-male boarding schools. And it was there that you discovered that you had a gift for speed, you're not just a fast bowler, but this speed can be used in a range of ways. Describe that to us. Well, I'm half Kenyan, so figuring out that I was a fast runner wouldn't have taken much. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen Kenyans running in races, haven't you? Um, there was a Kenyan who ran a while back. His name was um, um, uh, Barack Obama. So <laughs> <laughs> Kenyans are good at races. Um, Another story of uh, how I discovered I was quick was um, I was at school and I was on my way to the loos, which are about 30 meters away from the classroom block. And I, I turned to my left and I heard a rustling sound by the corner as I passed it, dustbin, leaves, etc. And in Africa, when you hear a rustling sound, you investigate, you turn, because unlike here in Australia where it might be a koala or an emu, <laughs> in Africa we've got about 10 animals that actually want to eat you. So. I must have been about this tall, and all I can say is there was an African spitting cobra about to strike. Hood was spread. Um, he was as tall as me, and five seconds later, I was 100 meters away. I think if Usain Bolt had raced me that day, I would have won. Henry is far too modest to tell you this, so I've got to say it on his behalf. At the age of 16, at a schoolboy inter-school athletics meet, he was timed doing the 100 meters in 10.6 seconds. I was trying to get away from the lion, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, you used this speed in a whole range of sports, and, uh, and eventually cricket came to the fore. But it wasn't only sport at high school. You also discovered that you had a love for the performing arts, and indeed singing, as, mm. we've, as we've heard and seen. Describe how that came about. Well, um, where, where did you say? No, it's that funny name. Isn't we're, it? At M we're at MBM. Okay, let's call it... <laughs> M, like the National Broadband Thing Network. Multicultural Bible Ministry. Oh, MBM. M yes. Ah, okay, well, I've no idea how compassionate the people of MBM are, but we'll find out. I've inside. been telling Henry that you're very compassionate, and we're going to learn about compassion from Colossians chapter 3 as so well. So here's hoping they can take a hint. Okay. Um, so I was in primary school for five years. At primary school, we put on a number of plays. One of the plays we put on was a play called The Sound of Music. Anyone remember The Sound of Music, right? Very familiar play. 
there's a place for anyone and everyone in that play. I mean, if you're a non-speaking, non-acting person, you can still get a role as the lonely goatherd or something. You understand? <laughs> there's a place for everyone. Um, we did another play called Bits of Broadway. Uh, took a few musical songs from, from, from shows. Uh, and, and we also did The King and I. Anyone remember The King and I? So anyway, um, I can't remember the last two plays, but I auditioned for every single one of those plays, every single one. And I got left out of every single one. Oh, no. oh Henry, t- that, was that, ru- was, that was rubbish. And that was a pretty big hint as it well. It was a big it? hint. In fact, some people laughed. I know. <laughs> I, I told him you're a compassionate group of people. I think we should give them one more chance. Although I auditioned for every single play in primary school, I got left out of every single one. Oh, that was slightly better. Slightly better. We only, need to move on. Only slightly. How did you remedy this when so, you got to high yes, school? I, so I got to high school and I auditioned for the play. I didn't know what the play was, but we did it. Uh, we, we did the audition in a hall, very similar to this, very long, piano at the front. The, the lady who was doing the auditions was a lady called Felix Westwood. She'd been at my school for almost 30 years when I arrived. And after I sung my solo part, we sung as a group, and then um, I sung, sung as a solo, I, she wrote my name down. I thought, <laughs> I'm in, my first play. Two things happened uh, after we were told to go and look at the notice board a couple of days later. Uh, the first thing was I discovered that the play was called Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma is based in the Deep South, and no self-respecting black man will be in a play about the Deep South, if you know what I mean. <laughs> the second thing I discovered was uh, that I'd been cast as a girl in Oklahoma. <laughs> I think you laughed too hard there, folks. <laughs> but I think it's fairly obvious to you that I don't have any feminine traits to my face. <laughs> Having said that, they had to put so much makeup on me, I should have been in Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, not Oklahoma. <laughs> so after the, fu- after the final performance, we had about four or five performances, we were in the green room and Felix Westwood, my teacher, that same teacher, 30 years almost at the school, was helping me take my makeup off, layers and layers of it. And she couldn't stop giggling. She got the fits of, of, of the giggles. And uh, uh, I said, ma'am, what's so funny? She said, Alonga, I hate to tell you this, but you're categorically the ugliest girl we have ever had in any play. <laughs> now, a weaker boy would have capitulated under that insult. I thought to myself, because I'm a very positive person, always see the cup as half full. You don't want to be too pretty in a boys only school, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so Henry, there were other plays? I think Pastor liked that way too much. <laughs> Sorry, do you say Reverend, uh, Minister? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so I took part in other plays at school. Um, uh, the final, one of the final plays that I did, I was Frederick and the Pirates of Bazaar. We also did another play called Annie Go Get Your, Annie Get Your Gun. Do you guys remember that? Anyone here? Okay, sing it with me. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can. Yes, I can. No, you. Yeah, that's a well done, folks. Very cultured here in. They are cultured. What's it called? Something Hill. Compassionate uh, and cultured. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so I then went on to. Uh, no, where we? Where are we? You've got to. You've got to prompt me here. I could go anywhere from here, mate. <laughs> So uh, you were so saying singing, the other play. Well, I was going to say. No, I'm done. I'm done with that. So the singing could have easily become a career for me. I took part in, in the choir as well and ended up being asked to sing in concerts all over the place. So singing almost became a career for me. Mm. In fact, a, a scout from the London Academy of Music and, and Dramatic Art came to my city. He auditioned me. He liked my voice um, and he offered me a scholarship. But unfortunately, my life veered off in a different direction. Mm. Henry, I just want to pause here. We're going to explore that Bible passage that was read, especially the first few sentences in it. And we're told right up front that since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This phrase, since then you have been raised with Christ, speaks about the fact that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can become Christians. Through his death and resurrection, we can in fact be raised to a new life. It's as if we were dead as Christ died and then Christ came back to life and we are made spiritually alive through him. I want to ask you how that happened for you when you were at high school. How did you, how were you raised with Christ? Just as we think about that aspect of your story. 
well, um, it was it was a very um, it was very interesting how I came to faith because I, I found myself in high school caught up in the, in the battle of worldviews, as it's called, the idea that the, there are different answers to the question, how did we come to be? And I think it's one of the most important questions. Uh, they, they say there are three big philosophical questions every human being asks, and, and they are basically, how did we get here? How, how did everything come into existence? Uh, what's my purpose? And, and what happens when we die? And I was wrestling with that. Look, I'm, I'm not going to suggest I was smart enough to know I was dealing with the big questions, but I knew I was searching for answers. And the great thing about my schools, both junior and high school, is they gave me an opportunity to explore both. Uh, on Sunday, I would hear that there's a God. He created the world. He created the world through his great power, through his wisdom, through his creativity, his artistry. And he made the world in a relatively short space of time. Uh, he made the first two human beings. He made the first man out of the dust of the earth. His name was Adam. Then he made his wife out of the side of Adam. And of course, uh, that's the first documented case of a man who got eaten out of his home. Uh, and then, no, but he should have manned up, shouldn't he? He should have manned he up. He should have, yes. He should have said no. Anyway, they get kicked out of paradise. Uh, and then, of course, the rest of the story shows this extraordinary God, far from abandoning these human rebels and their descendants, actually starting to create a plan uh, by which he would uh, undo the, the fall, if you will, reconcile humanity to himself. And, um, of course, prophets foretell it, and it actually happens. Jesus, born in a manger, God in human flesh, the incarnation, lives a great life as a young boy. He's wise as a man. He's got this amazing ministry where he heals people, raises the dead, does extraordinary miracles. Uh, but the central part or purpose or mission of this man was to go to a cruel Roman cross. And, and whenever I heard that, that message, it always warmed my heart. And I, I, I got it. I understood that if there be a God, he has demonstrated his love in such a way that we are left without any uh, confusion about the fact that he loves us and wants us. And so at a Christian youth camp, I was encouraged to make a decision for Jesus. And I did. I, I invited God into my heart. I converted, became a Christian. Um, and of course, I, I wish that that existed in, in, in a vacuum, but it didn't. On, on Monday morning, I'd go to biology class and I'd be told, actually, God is a myth. You don't need a creator. You don't need a deity. You don't need a supernatural being to start off the universe. All you need is a singularity. What's that? It's a, it's a tiny piece of matter, so small, it almost doesn't exist, but big enough to exist. And everything, like everything, like Jupiter, the solar system, the stars, everything, fits into this little thing. And then it exploded in what's commonly called the Big Bang. Now, you don't hear sound in a vacuum, so it could have been any sound. It could have been the big zhip or the bing bing, <laughs> but they just call it the Big Bang. Um, and... <laughs> And then you had the primitive solar system, and you had the young Earth. And the young Earth was just a ball full of water and some land poking out. We don't know where it came from, but it was there. And then there was a bolt of lightning. Who knows why the lightning zapped or where it came from? You need a little bit of faith, so stick with this. And then all of a sudden, you got the first amino acids, and then something supernatural happened. Non-living material became living. And then in time, through errors, what we call mutations. Now, I'll tell you a secret. Nowadays... Mutations cause cancer, which kill you. But back in the day, it was actually the vehicle to create more complex life. <laughs> and then you had a fish. Uh, let's call the fish uh, something that turned into an amphibian. And apparently, all life evolved in Africa, according to the movie Lara Croft's Tomb Raider. So it must be true. <laughs> and, if, and, and proof of that, the fact that Africans don't like living in the water and evolved onto land is the fact that you are hard pressed to find an African man with a gold medal around his neck for the butterfly or the backstroke. <laughs> <laughs> so we like being on land. And then of course, um, the story goes on to suggest that these amphibians developed, you know, fins, fins turned into legs and, and you had land walking mammals, which were gorillas, monkeys, apes, etc. from the goo to the zoo to you. Highly evolved pond scum. Highly evolved monkeys. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but those two <laughs> different ideas of how we came to be make you feel very different about yourself. And I, I understood that if there be a God, it also affects my decisions, choices, my morality. And uh, I think most people know if, if there is no God, you, you can have a party, man. You know, there's, just no, there's no, no consequences to life. There's no accountability. And after making my decision to follow Christ, I also reflected on the fact that that must actually 
act out into the world. You know, if I call myself a Christian, I shouldn't be a closet Christian, a secret Christian. It must mean that there's certain choices and decisions and, and directions I take that reflect that Jesus is in me, that the Holy Spirit lives in me, and that I am, as effect, God's hands and his feet and, and, and his mouthpiece. And so that kind of started to feed into the way I started mm. thinking as a person and as a cricketer. Mm. Thank you for that. Here's an example of someone who has been raised with Christ. That happened in Henry's past, and he's been a Christian now for many, many years. And here at MBM, we want to commend that same message, that wonderful hope that we can have through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Henry, it sounds along the way, both in terms of your Christian journey, in terms of your discovery of your speed and your love for singing, that a lot of people invested in your life. And just before we move on, I'm going to ask Henry to sing a song. And as he does so, I want you to think about those, especially on Father's Day. Now, as we've been reminded that some of us haven't had the greatest of father models. Henry didn't have the greatest of father models. But there have been people who have been father-like figures. There have been school teachers. There have been coaches. There have been our mums. May be a sporting coach. It may be a music coach. There have been friends who have come alongside us, who have modelled important things to us and invested in our life. And as you listen to the words of this song, thank God for those people around you who have done that for you and made you a stronger person as a result. And as you hear the words, think of this great creator God who hasn't given up on his humanity even though we turned our back on him and astonishingly has given us his son so that through him we may have this gift of life. As Henry sings, think about the way that God has created you in his image. That God loves you and wants you to be a part of his family. Henry, the song, You Raise Me Up. When I am down and all oh my soul so weary When troubles come and my heart burden be Then I am still and wait here in the silence Until you come and sit a while with me you raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up. To more than I can be There's no life No life without its hunger Each restless heart Beats so imperfectly And when you come And I am filled with wonder Sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong. When I am on your shoulders, you raise me up 
to more than I can be. Very low standards here. No, they have very high standards, very discerning people. Henry, as we continue to explore this wonderful part of the Bible, it goes on to say, set your minds on things that are above and not on things of the earth. And this series that you've been looking at speaks about the way in which, and I guess it plays on that phrase, that saying you've heard that Christians can be so heavenly minded that they're no earthly use. But setting your mind on things that are above doesn't mean looking at the clouds and just thinking about the future. It actually speaks about the way in which you relate in the world. I've heard you say that, and I think you said it this morning, you've always wanted your faith to make a difference in the world. You didn't want to be a secret Christian. You didn't want to be accused of being a hypocrite. And so as much as possible, you wanted your Christian life to make a difference, not only in your own life, but in the lives of others. You had an opportunity to do that at the 2003 World Cup, when you're an international cricketer, uh, you've been out of the game for a while, you actually got accused of, you got, uh, you got called for chucking or throwing. And that had, was at the beginning of my Yeah, career. you had to correct your action. You came back into the team, and then in 2003, you made a very bold and courageous decision to stand up to the corruption in your country and the evil dictatorship of Robert Mugabe. Just talk us through that. Well, a couple of things. The first thing I'll say is Robert Mugabe became, it became apparent to me that he was a dictator and Africa's had a big problem with dictators. I mean, the world over has had problems with dictators, but Africa in particular. Um, and dictators aren't the smartest people. I actually heard of a man called Idi Amin. Anyone heard of Idi Amin? I heard he bought a boat, and do you know what he called it? He called it the idiot. Um, so not the smartest people. Um, so growing up in a dictatorship meant that um, in my country, many people were victims of Mugabe's brutality, uh, whether they were killed or tortured or thrown in prison on trumped up charges, or whether there was just a constant sort of opposition to them, if, especially if they were members of the opposing party, the MDC. Uh, great corruption, great mismanagement in Zimbabwe, etc. And at some point, my, I, had, I came to an understanding that my Christian faith ought to intersect with this difficult world I lived in. And I'll give you a couple of uh, scripture references. One comes from Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, where uh, the scriptures record God saying, Contend for the widow and the orphan, rebuke the oppressor. Very simple um, line, but it really spoke to me powerfully one day when I realized that Mugabe was an oppressor and rebuking him is what God would ask us to do. In another place in the Bible, it tells us um, to, to, rather than having anything to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather e expose them and throw in there the story of the Good Samaritan. And you've got a young man who's ready to, to allow God to use him to speak out and stand up for people who are uh, downtrodden or, or victims in a sense. And I didn't want to be the guy who walked on the other side of the road when he saw the victim. I wanted to be the guy who got his hands dirty. And so I got an opportunity to do that. Um, a man called uh, Andrew Flower, who was a teammate of mine, former captain of the Zimbabwe team, very celebrated cricketer, actually, uh, for those cricket tragics in the room, retired with an average over 50, so in elite company. He was about to retire. Um, but he enlisted me to, to try and get the whole team to do a protest. Uh, very early on, we figured we couldn't do that. Uh, it was too difficult for all sorts of reasons. In any case, um, we decided that we would do a, a protest, just the two of us, he and I, and we would wear black armbands as symbols of mourning the death of democracy. And probably the most important thing we did was we wrote a statement, uh, which you can still find on the internet if you, if you look hard enough, in which we were appealing to the powers that be to stop what they were doing. It was, it was really a silent protest and a silent plea and, a, in a sense, a very gentle sort of, please stop doing this. And, but the government didn't take it lightly and uh, there were repercussions which happened straight away. What were the consequences? 
Um, so I was dropped from the team. Um, I didn't play too much of a role in the 2003 World Cup after that. Um, I also um, got dropped from, by my cricket club. And, and I think probably the most hurtful thing was the press started writing articles to, you know, to do damage control and they started attacking our characters. Uh, and they, they started accusing us of be, being uh, British paid spies. I mean, I can't think of anything more insulting than being called a... But then I thought to myself, half cup full, David. Mm. There's never been a black James Bond, has there? <laughs> <laughs> and, very serious consequences, you also heard. Well... Well, and then, then, then the stakes got higher. Um, I then got death threats, and uh, then I realized, okay, um, the rubbers hit the road. And within a very short space of time, my life changed. I realized I couldn't stay in Zimbabwe. And really through the miraculous provision of God through divine intervention, I was able to get through to South Africa because we got a draw to a game we needed to draw to get through to the next round, to get the points. And so eventually uh, escaped Zimbabwe, Settled in South Africa for about a month or so. I don't know if that's called settling, but anyway, I was there for a short while. And you uh, were you were really hiding in South Africa. I was. You were living in someone's basement, weren't you? I and, was. And not coming out very often. I then got a, an offer, and uh, the offer was to go and do some cricket commentary in the UK. And I took it up, and I understood why. Because the reason they, they got me to go to to the UK to do some commentary, Test Mass Special in the BBC and Channel 4, um, um, was because... Zimbabwe were going to tour England that summer and Richie Benno, Mark Nicholas and a few of the other commentators didn't know how to pronounce some of those African names, you know. <laughs> they had no idea. So I did that and then a couple of other things and settled. Henry, I just want to backtrack to the cricket for a few moments as we think about this part of the Bible. Living this Christian life means not having your head in the clouds, but it means that you are a person who wants to make changes in people's lives on this earth. We want people to come to Christ and we want to help people who are voiceless. And the way that this Bible passage explains it, it says that there are certain things that we should put off or put to death even, kill, get rid of. And there's a list of those things. One of those things is sexual immorality. Another one of those things is greed. And there are things that we should put on, like compassion, which you're, you're beginning to learn a little bit more about today. With a big hint. But let me ask you this question. When you, when you bowled, when you were a fast bowler, did you go out to the field in that overcoat? Did you try and bowl in that overcoat? What would have happened if you did? Oh, they would, have, they would have taken me off the field and banned me as a, someone who'd invaded the pitch. So, of course, you've got, you, there's a uniform you have to put on, if you will, if you're going to play but in a cricket team. Certain clothes you've got to take off. Correct. So, um, and so, with this passage, it says, get rid of sexual immorality, get rid of greed, become a generous person. Sure. So, like that overcoat, you can't bowl in that, you can't bowl in those shoes. You've got to put off certain clothes. And, 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 and it's... it's being in, in the arena where you're, you're in, the, in, in, the, in the middle of a field or on stage, um, the temptations do come. You know, there, there's no doubt about it. And I think, I think we all face it, don't we? We all face temptations to do things that we know are worldly or fleshly or carnal. And we know what the Bible says, that we shouldn't be doing them. But we also fail. Now, I'm not confessing, by the way. <laughs> I'm just saying that very often we know what we ought to put off. And yet, sometimes in our failures we find God's grace reaching down to us. So the Bible tells us that God will not allow us to get tempted beyond what we can bear, and he'll always give us a way out. So hand on heart, thankfully, by the grace of God, I was able to avoid any major pitfalls in the sexual immorality uh, arena. I was also able to you know, not get into a, a drinking or drug problem or, or gambling or anything like that. But you know, there were close shaves, and, but God was faithful in giving the way out. And, and that's, that's the great thing is, although he commends us, Paul, as, as he does there, to put things off and put things on, we're not alone in that. We know that God's Holy Spirit mm. empowers us to be able to say no to unrighteousness when the opportunities do come. There's a devil out there, and boy, he's, he's an opportunist, and he's going to keep firing those darts and those, those arrows, and he wants to make you trip up. But I think it's great that we can go into partnership with God 
in living in a corrupt and polluted world and be able to call on him when we're in times of testing and, and, and when the temptation comes. So Henry, you're in the dressing room, you're getting rid of the overcoat, you're getting rid of the tie, you're getting rid of these clunky shoes, and there's a cricket uniform you're putting on. Mm. Now let me ask you this question, when you batted, did you ever wear a helmet? Certainly did. But let and me just we've say, discovered that helmets are very, very important, haven't we? I think the helmets were wasted on me and the bat as well because I didn't make many runs. <laughs> but but, but they, I bet you bowled a few <laughs> short pitch deliveries and I bet you had to face a few of them as well. Absolutely. They are protective. They're there to, to make sure that you, you, you know, sadly in cricket we have had a tragedy in which a, a batsman was uh, killed recently. I mean, it's happened throughout the history of the game, but a very uh, young uh, Cricketer called Phil Hughes was killed a few, and, and of and course Steve, Steve Smith, Smith was, yeah, yeah. was hit only recently. Yeah. So, so can, can you see where this illustration is going in this wonderful part of the Bible? Put things off, put things on, like a helmet for a cricketer. Where to put on compassion and kindness and forgiveness, because God has forgiven us, and so we can live a life where enjoying that wonderful forgiveness of our creator, we can learn to forgive one another. And in that way, we live a life where we can't be accused of being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly use. Because if we seek the things that are above, we are seeking practical things that can change our own lives, our own character, and change the lives of those around us. So we've looked at the past, we've looked at the present. For a few moments as we come to a close, I want us just to think of the future. We're told in the fourth sentence that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. And again, that's a, a wonderful description of the future hope that those who place their trust in Jesus. At the end of time, when Jesus returns, we will appear with him. We'll be on his side. We'll be seen as a part of his family. We'll receive the outcome of that wonderful promise of eternal life. Henry, five or six countries you've lived in, and at least two of them as a fugitive and in exile. There's a sense in which you've been wandering this earth. You've had no permanent home. And the Bible actually says that our true home is with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Henry, do you just want to reflect on, on that wonderful gift of heaven and eternal life that we're promised? Well, one of the things that we as Christians have, one of the privileges is that we can have insight into the future because God has prophesied over what is going to happen. And the picture we get of the future that I love to refer to is in the book of Revelation, where we're told that there'll be a time when God will create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning. We're told that the former things will have passed. And I don't know what that looks like, but I can imagine that there'll be something to the effect of eternal youth. I don't think we'll get older over there. New knees, Mr. Manfield, Mr. Manfield. <laughs> New and hips. our relationships. Will and be, our relationships yeah. will be restored. We'll be there. And the most amazing thing is God wants a big family. We're told that there'll be every tribe, every language, every nation, and I love that this, this, this church is integrated and we have, it's multicultural because this reflects heaven. And the, the most extraordinary thing is, if you flip forward to the last chapter of um, Revelation, we hear an appeal by the Spirit of God saying, come, all you who are thirsty, and drink freely from the water of life. And it's an amazing promise that God will fix things, God will create a new heaven. It's going to be beautiful. There might be colors we've never seen, sounds we've never heard, beautiful plants. I don't know. I, I think it's going to be an amazing place. 
And isn't it amazing that God actually wants you? He wants you, whoever you are. If you don't know God, he wants you there. But he says it's over to you. You have to decide. You're thirsty and you want this too. And that you want to have eternal life, eternal health, eternal bliss, and eternal rest. And, and might I say, in Africa, we call that a no-brainer. <laughs> I don't know what you call it here. Ladies and gentlemen, would you thank Henry Alonga? <laughs> Henry is going to sing one more song. After the song, I don't want you to applaud him. You've already thanked him. Just thank him again, will you? Yep. Get the clap out of your system. After the song, just think reflectively for a couple of moments. Henry is going to sing about this great creator God. The astonishing love of God. Who, even though we turned our back on him, gave up his one and only son. So that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be forgiven and receive this great gift of eternal life. But not only does this amazing grace bring us into God's family, this amazing grace keeps us through difficult times. We've heard of a man who has gone through very challenging times, through hard times, through dangerous times. This grace, this God keeps us in the palm of his hand. And this song also speaks of the grace that brings us home, brings us home to our permanent place in the new heaven and the new earth where everything is good and right. Henry Alonga, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first. Believed through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already gone. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. Our great and gracious God, our loving and compassionate Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of grace, this undeserved love that you lavish upon us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins and for the promise of eternal life. And Heavenly Father, our prayer is for each other, for everyone in this building, that we would embrace, that we would enjoy, that we would have 
the assurance of this love and grace. The assurance of where we're going in being with the Lord Jesus Christ in a perfect universe beyond this life. We thank you for our true home through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.